Okay. Um, welcome, everybody. I hope you can hear me well. Um, so, formal welcome, everyone who has joined us uh, here this uh, afternoon in person uh, as well as online for this very important side event called How a Gender Responsive Approach Can Better Equip Us to Respond to Climate Change, Food Insecurity and Migration. Let me briefly um, introduce myself. My name is Inkeri van Hase. I am the global coordinator of the Germany-funded Making Migration Safe for Women project at UN Women. Today with me, um, I have uh, Mr. Reinhard Hassenflug, Councillor for Migration um, Affairs at the Permanent Mission of the Federal Republic of Germany to the Office of the United Nations here in Geneva. And I have Ms. Iliana Sinciana Puskas, a uh, program officer on migration, environment, and climate change at IOM. Online, we have three excellent speakers who will be discussing the linkages between gender, migration, climate change, and food security. They are Ms. Um, Georgia Prati, who is a migration and climate change specialist at FAO. We also have Dr. Jenna Hennebury, Professor at the Baseli School of International Affairs, Wilfrid Laurie University in Canada. And we have Mr. Shakirul Islam, chairperson of the Obibashi Kami Unayan program, um, which is a grassroots migrants organization in Bangladesh. So today's side event uh, will be in the style of a fireside chat. Um, in which I will be guiding a, a more intimate, uh, more technical discussion among the um, expert speakers. So the expert speakers will be asked to draw on their own experiences to respond to the questions, sharing their views and insights on how a gender responsive approach can better help us address migration in the context of climate change and food insecurity. As we have limited time, I would, like, I, I would like to ask the speakers to be brief in their uh, responses. And then after the discussion, um, I will turn um, it over to the audience, both online and in the room, for further questions and discussions. But first, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Hassenflug from the permanent mission of uh, Germany um, to the UN here in Gen Geneva to provide opening remarks. Um, Mr. Hassenflug, you've got the floor. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mrs. von Hase. Excellencies, colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a great pleasure and honor to say a few words at the beginning of the side event on gender-responsive approach to climate change, food insecurity, and migration. I would like to thank UN Women and IOM for having taken the initiative and having organized this event on this very important topic. Please allow me now to share with you some opening remarks. In many parts of the world, women depend heavier on natural resources than men and bear a greater responsibility to secure water and food for their families. Climate change has thus a particularly hard impact on women in all their diversity. Migration, if voluntary and safe, can be an empowering opportunity by improving access to resources, trainings, and jobs. However, women are often not able to move in anticipation of hazards. They are therefore at greater risk when a disaster strikes, including the risk to be displaced. To ensure that everybody, regardless of origin, gender, or identity, can benefit from migration, we need a, greater, we need a gender responsive approach. Therefore, Germany is following feminist foreign and development policies to help break down discriminatory power structures, social norms, and roles. But what does this mean for climate-induced migration? For us, there are three important aspects. First, equal rights for women and girls must be ensured before, during, and after migration. This includes having access to land, education, and work. Second, gender must always be considered when planning early warning mechanisms climate risk insurance schemes, 
evacuation or resettlement. And third, women must be included as equal partners in the formulation of climate and migration policies. That is a call to action for all of us, particularly looking ahead at the upcoming COP27. To follow this call, Germany will, amongst other activities, continue supporting the platform on disaster displacement, stay engaged through the Migration Multi-Partner Trust Fund, and intensify our cooperation with UN Women and other key actors in order to further promote and implement a gender-responsive approach to the global challenges of climate change, food insecurity, and migration. Thank you very much, and I'm now looking forward to the conversation between our expert speakers and to a fruitful discussion afterwards. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Mr. Reinhard Hassenflug, for these powerful words and for the call um, to action and for highlighting the importance of uh, giving women and girls equal rights during all stages of migration, as well as um, uh, the importance of their meaningful uh, participation in the development and implementation of migration and climate change policies and laws and services. Um, to get us started, I also have some um, reflections that I would like to share. Um, as Antonio Vitorino already highlighted in his opening statement, um, women and girls very much bear the brunt of climate change. This is because women and girls across the world must find food and water for their families due to deeply entrenched um, and traditional gender roles and norms. Given that climate change is a major driver of biodiversity loss, women now and girls must now travel, travel longer distances, which increases their risks of sexual gen and gender-based violence and re reduces their time for paid work, political participation, and simply just rest. Also, two-thirds of the world's farmers in the developing world are women, many of whom may be compelled to move elsewhere due to natural disasters and changing climates in order to make ends meet and in order to provide food for their, their families. While sex disaggregated data and gender statistics on people migrating in the context of climate change are scarce, we know that 80% of people displaced by climate change are women, given their limited access to productive resources and formal rights. Also, while climate change related slow onset events, uh, as well as climate shocks, tend to lead um, people first to, internally, um, to internal displacement, many people also cross borders. However, due to a lack of um, safe and regular migration pathways in response to the climate crisis, many are, uh, uh, have no other options but to turn to more um, unsafe and irregular pathways. Without gender-responsive migration policies and laws, migrant women and girls, as well as LGBTIQ plus migrants, are exposed to greater risks of rights violations, such as sexual gender-based violence, forced labor, and trafficking in persons during their migration. Let us now turn to our expert speakers who are online for a deeper discussion on these issues and also look at solutions. So, I will pose three questions and ask each of the panelists in responding to one of them first. After all of you had a chance to respond, I will then move on to the next question. And uh, without further ado, I would like to ask our first question um, of today's side event. Um, what are the biggest gender-specific challenges right now for migrants and their families and communities in the context of climate change and food security. Jenna, I would like to, please, I'd like to ask you to please initiate the discussion, after which I'd like to turn to Georgia and then to Shakarul. Jenna, you've got the floor. Thank you very much, Inkri, and thank you, colleagues, uh, for the opportunity uh, to participate uh, today in this um, uh, cutting edge, I think, discussion uh, and, and way in which we're trying to approach it. So thank you very much for including me. I guess I would start with a rather, um, uh, maybe it's provocative, maybe it's not, but I want to basically start with a statement that in reality, the challenges we're talking about 
are not really new. Um, they're not entirely specific uh, to climate change and food security. The very same structural inequalities and gendered cultural and social economic systems are actually the terrain on which climate change is being borne out. Um, and uh, as, as noted already, these sort of uh, underlying, deeply rooted inequalities that happen well before migration even incur occurs are actually um, are, are leading to the kind of uh, experiences of migration that are highly gendered and pose particular risks uh, to, uh, to women in particular, as well as LGBTQI plus migrants uh, with diverse sojis, and, and basically cause uh, heightened risk um, of personal, to personal security, uh, as well as experiences of food security, experiences um, that uh, extend uh, an impact uh, particularly uh, women and LGBTQ plus migrants. But we know that gender impacts all people, uh, regardless of, uh, of, of, of their uh, identity, regardless and intertwined with many other differentiating factors, um, socioeconomic location, disability, age, and other factors, alongside whether they live in rural or urban contexts, and their geographic realities, such as near oceans or deserts, and their political realities, such as regions with conflict. Uh, with conflict. All of these factors combine together uh, and mean that uh, the challenges are exacerbated uh, uh, in this context. For men and boys, for example, climate change means higher rates of unemployment, difficulty accessing employment, malnutrition, uh, family separation, and for those living without resources and poverty, increase of human rights violations, including trafficking for the purposes of forced labor in particular. Also, for uh, uh, increased risk of detention and death, uh, we've seen in the context of the Mediterranean. For LGBTIQ plus migrants, we're talking about increased risks of um, uh, sexual ex exploitation, trafficking for the purposes of sexual exploitation, as well as concentration in risky and unregulated work, um, sex work, for example, in, in delivery services. And we see this among uh, uh, the LGBTQ plus migrants in Ecuador from Venezuela, for example. There's real protection challenges uh, that um, migrants with diverse sojis face, uh, in particular, um, you know, often not being recognized uh, in terms of their gender identity, uh, having different uh, um, uh, potential risks uh, and, uh, and facing more discrimination. Women and girls, we know, um, are, are primarily caregivers often and in these contexts, feeding and, and bathing families, still doing mostly unpaid repair work and, and uh, uh, care work in, in along the way, uh, and also um, experiencing uh, risks of maternal health uh, risks and increased risks of sexual and reproductive health. Generally speaking, we know too uh, that uh, women uh, experience higher rates of violence uh, during conflicts, during crises, including environmental disasters, as we've seen in the context of Ebola, um, uh, Ebola, uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, and other environmental disasters. Um, we've also seen uh, it in the context of uh, migration, uh, obviously, and um, to say that um, it comes down to this, climate change, both slow onset and acute crises are continue to be important drivers of migration, but we know uh, already uh, migration is gendered and with dwindling options for sustained livelihoods and acute crises and displacement, um, migration is the only option for survival for many. So the biggest challenge uh, I believe facing Migra migrants at this point in time is access to regular pathways do not, that do not further their insecurity or deepen their gender inequality. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenna, um, for um, this uh, rich intervention. And I'd like to um, call now on um, Georgia from the FAO to um, take the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry, and I would also like to thank the organizers for having me today in this very relevant discussion. I'll try to answer your question given to it a rural development and, and, and food security focus. Um, as we heard this morning from the FAO's Director General, climate change impacts every aspect of agriculture and food systems, 
affecting the lives and livelihoods of men and women in so many ways. And these impacts we know that are not gender neutral. They are instead shaped by the underlying conditions of inequality, the different roles and responsibilities, and also by cultural and social norms. As it was said already, women are disproportionately affected by the impacts of climate change. And obviously, there are different degrees of uh, and types of vulnerabilities uh, also within women and men, social groups, depending on age, ethnicity, marital status, and other intersecting traits and social identities relevant to a particular context. If we zoom for a moment into gender inequality in food insecurity and nutrition, we notice that compared with men, women are more vulnerable to chronic food and nutrition insecurity, as well as to shock-induced food insecurity. According to the State of Food and Agriculture report published this year, globally and in every region, the prevalence of food insecurity is higher among women than men. If we disaggregate the number of moderate, moderately or severely food insecure people worldwide, in 2021, there was a four percentage points gender gap between men and women, which has grown of one point from 2020. The impacts of climate change and food security threaten the to widen even more inequality and to exacerbate vulnerability. In terms of mobility, there might be various outcomes, which include changed migration patterns, forced migration and forced displacement, and also immobility, considered as the inability to move. If we apply a gender lens onto these scenarios, uh, there are at least two broad considerations that can be made, which point to specific challenges. First, as it was mentioned uh, already, higher vulnerability to the impacts of climate change may increase pressure to migrate or lead to forced displacement, with a consequent exposure, exposure to gender-based violence, exploitation, and all the risks faced by migrant women. In addition to this, because of their roles and responsibilities, women's vulnerability to climate change continue also after migration and displacement. Most refugees and IDPs, for example, living in camps, mainly depend on firewood for cooking, um, for cooking. And in situations of resource scarcities, collecting firewood exposes women to life-threatening challenges ranging from sexual violence, health hazards, and tensions with the host communities. The second consideration should be made with regards to the women who remain behind in areas vulnerable to the impacts of climate change when men migrate. Migration leads to a redistribution of tasks and responsibilities within the household, which most often results in increased work burden for women. While this is a typical gender implication of male out migration, the effects of climate change on natural resources intensify even more domestic and care workload, putting an increased burden. Male out migration can expose women to new vulnerabilities and present new challenges to their ability to adapt to climate change. When women take up agricultural activities, um, they are faced with numerous, numerous barriers with regards to access to inputs, assets, credit, and services, including access to uh, climate smart technologies. And these barriers not only limit their opportunities and ability to adapt, but also affect their family food security. So women's limited participation in strategic decision-making, for example, over natural resources management is, is a significant limitation and has broader implications for community resilience, especially in context of high male out migration. And finally, a last point I wanted to make is that um, there are also some considerations to be made with regards to disaster preparedness and evacuation during disasters. The absence of men, in fact, put women at higher risk in contexts where cultural and social norms uh, may limit women's ability to learn life-saving skills, for example, swim, uh, or to evacuate without, uh, without consent. I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you so much, Georgia, for um, highlighting these, uh, these issues in such a powerful way and also, you know, for sharing um, the um, data on the widening um, gender gap in terms of food insecurity, which is only likely to, you know, increase um, as a result of climate change. Um, and now I'd like to ask Shaki Ru um, for his uh, response to the question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, respected moderator, expert colleagues, uh, friends, uh, thank you uh, for inviting me um, in this important discussion. I just want to share uh, in the beginning of this, uh, uh, you know, of my intervention is like, well, uh, we are talking here in this conference, uh, a strong super cyclone 
named Citrang is coming across to Bangladesh uh, to, uh, uh, to heat uh, by tonight. So uh, it is uh, you know, supposed to heat all 13 coastal districts in Bangladesh. So nearly 35 million Bangladeshi uh, population in the coastal districts are under threat at this moment. And uh, apart from that, actually, uh, 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 you know, uh, what I want to share as part of, uh, from, from my experiences in the, uh, in the research, uh, longitudinal research that we, we are going, um, you know, we are going to do at this moment, um, we actually heard from the people uh, of the coastal area in July that there is no rain. So they are, uh, you know, uh, feeling, uh, I mean, uh, in, in the feeling that uh, uh, this year will be will become a barren year and there is no scope to uh, uh, to cultivate uh, because of uh, no fresh water because they uh, depend on the rain water only on the other hand when uh, we uh, went to visit the same places in um, in um, you know end of september we we heard that there is a heavy rain during this period and it, it has undated everything uh, uh, so uh, so so that uh, i mean that the rain actually uh, indicted everything but uh, they, it helped uh, them to cultivate to start you know uh, prepare the, uh, the the grounds and you know uh, start cultivation of crops uh, uh, but you know uh, uh, these are the realities actually and now the cyclone is uh, coming and then everything will be really uh, you know in undated because uh, it is like uh, eight feet uh, high uh, waves are coming uh, to heat the areas tonight uh, so uh, in this situation actually uh, 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 people uh, try to find a new place uh, to live in and try to find uh, uh, a new place to find new jobs and you know uh, the livelihood opportunities and in such a context actually in Bangladesh we have both type of trends like internal migration and also uh, international or cross-border migration if I talk about the internal migration uh, our experiences and research shows that uh, mainly uh, men member of the family migrate but again 10% uh, from our previous research, 10% women actually take part um, uh, in, in, in a seasonal migration with their husbands. But, uh, you know, uh, the women, uh, especially uh, uh, who take part in the migration, but also who do not, do not take part in the migration, but still left behind in the community to take care of the children, they, they face uh, numbers of challenges, uh, you know, in terms of lack of protection, in terms of lack of food security in terms of, you know, uh, the adolescence girl, uh, uh, the insecurity of their adolescence girl. So these issues really very common and severe, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, but these issues are really addressed in the policy and the implementation or actions at local level community. But if I talk about the international migration, uh, mm, yes, we have uh, legislation for migration, we have policy, uh, but I will say that uh, uh, the, the, the unfair practice of, in, in recruitment uh, process is really evident, and that's why the women actually face different kind of difficulties and problems, violation of their rights, uh, and sexual exploitation throughout the whole migration uh, cycle. And if I give a particular evidence of a woman who recently returned back uh, with with the support of our organization, um, which is a grassroots migrant organization. Uh, he said that he went to Saudi Arabia uh, with the support of a recruitment agencies. Uh, and he was, uh, he was supposed to work uh, in a house as a domestic worker. And when he, she actually uh, arrived, uh, she was forced to work in different houses uh, because the employer had a uh, number of relatives. So she actually forced her to work in all the houses. And within uh, two or three months, she became sick. And then she actually asked the women to uh, send her back to home. Uh, but the, um, the employer actually sent her back to the recruitment agencies. And that was a torture sale for her as she described. She said that she was forced to go to a uh, hotel and have, uh, you know, uh, 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 
uh, take part in the sex uh, business uh, because the recruitment uh, because the uh, recruiting agencies uh, actually forced them uh, until she was returned she was sent back home uh, uh, you know six months so these all are challenges that the women migrant workers or women particularly in this context when they are forced they are compelled to leave their country because there is no livelihood and particularly because there is uh, 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 the critical impact of uh, you know, climate change in, um, in in the region. So they are facing uh, this kind of challenges, uh, abuse, exploitation in the whole cycle, uh, particularly in migration cycle. So uh, I think I can end now uh, and wait for the next questions. Thank you, Shakiru, for sharing um, these experiences uh, in Bangladesh and also for highlighting the specific challenges of migrant women domestic workers in your country and beyond. Um, now I'd like to move on to the next question. Um, and the question is, from your experiences, what does it mean to take a gender-responsive approach to the design, development, and implementation of policies and programs to address the complex challenges of climate change, food security, and migration? What are the challenges and what are the opportunities of taking a gender-responsive approach to these is issues? And Georgia, I, I would like to ask you to start us off on this question and then followed by Shakurul and Jenna. Over to you, Georgia. Thank you, Kerry. So rural populations are, we know that they are among the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change because of their high dependence on natural resources, as it was already stressed out, and overall low capacity to adapt. And strengthening the resilience of rural people, therefore, is of utmost importance. And, and that should be done, obviously, in, in a gender-responsive way. Now, gender-responsive actions are, are, in fact, key to effective adaptation strategies and gender sensitive approaches are needed to ensure that gender equality and women's concern in climate resilience agriculture, for example, are addressed. Um, so strengthening climate resilience in a gender responsive way requires uh, an integrated approach. And policies and programs need to simultaneously address structural issues, uh, such as improving access to land tenure and other natural and productive assets, as well as integrate women farmers into agri-food value chains and relevant decision-making processes. And this can be achieved by making agricultural systems, for example, res responsive to socioeconomic and gender issues. And to give some examples of how climate smart agricultural development can be made uh, gender responsive, it is important, for instance, to conduct gender sensitive vulnerability and capacity assessments at the design phase to ensure that programs and policies address differentiated needs and capitalize on women's and men's capacities. Uh, it is important to take measures to improve the productivity and reduce the time and work burdens of women small-scale farmers. This entails, among other things, improving access to productive resources, which contributes to reduce women's exposure and sensitivity to climate shocks, making climate information systems accessible, timely, and user-friendly for both women and men, and promoting positive social attitudes and practices about women's roles in, in, in agriculture and women's uptake of climate smart technologies. Public and private financial institutions should be made also more gender equitable. For example, consider women's limited collateral and increase the level of credit for women, women farmers. Um, it's important to promote opportunities for women to participate in all segments of the value chain. So the assessment of agricultural value chains should also take a gender responsive approaches to ensure that equal opportunities are provided to men and women and that entry points are identified to strengthen women's capacity to move, for example, from production to other segments of the value chain. And it is obviously key to uh, ensure women's particip participation in planning policies and budget processes, and this cuts across all sectors, I would say. And the second point of reflection is that um, take gender-responsive approaches in climate, agriculture, and migration policies and programs should always strive at addressing the structural constraints to, to gender equality. Um, as I generally said before, I mean, this is, um, this is not new. 
And inequality is a major underlying factor of vulnerability to climate change. And gender inequality affect women's adaptation options too. So climate adaptation policies and programs, including those agriculture related, have over focused on what will be called specific adaptation measures, meaning technical solutions to manage specific climate risks, which could be developing specific technologies, for example. There is, however, the need to bring back the development dimension of climate adaptation and address at the same time the underlying socioeconomic and cultural factors that generate vulnerability and limit the capacity in the first place. The risk is otherwise to reinforce inequality and further marginalize vulnerable social groups, including women. So gender responsive and inclusive climate action should steer towards transformative adaptation, which aims at designing and implementing adaptation policies and programs that really bring transformational ch change and, and do challenge inequality. Thank you so much, uh, Georgia. Um, um, and um, I think it was uh, very important that you underscored the importance for transformative um, adaptation strategies uh, that take into consideration the different needs um, and situations of uh, women and girls. Um, in response uh, to climate change and food insecurity. And now I'd like to hand over the floor to uh, Shakuru, please, and then to Jenna, thanks. Um, thank you very much. I think it's really important uh, to talk about the gender res responsive approaches to address the uh, crisis difficulties, uh, uh, you know, in line with climate change, uh, food security and migration. You know, being a migrant organization, uh, we have, uh, you know, number of interventions actually from uh, from 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 the beginning of our organization. So, uh, if I give uh, uh, you know uh, uh, our experiences as a, as a reference, how we actually address uh, gender in our interventions, uh, 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 then I can I, I think it can help you to understand uh, because you know uh, we really believe that. Uh, uh, the uh, the women, particularly as as uh, uh, you know, from the perspective of gender, have their special vulnerability that we really need to consider when we design uh, or develop any kind of interventions. For example, if we design uh, intervention for for the women uh, migration, then definitely we uh, need to consider. What kind of, uh, uh, I mean, we, we need to consider the pre-decision orientation and in the pre-decision orientation, which is we usually contact at community level to provide all kinds of information, the risks and vulnerabilities of women in the whole migration cycle and also the opportunities for them so that they can take informed decision for my migration uh, depending uh, uh, on, uh, on consideration of uh, the risks and vulnerabilities they might face or the opportunities uh, that, uh, uh, that there are exist. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, very often uh, we provide uh, 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 I mean, uh, 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 from, from different perspectives that we actually offer some kind of the skills that they do not really need. Uh, but, you know, uh, from our organization, we always think what kind of needs of the women are and what are the resources and local opportunities that they can use. So we actually consider this kind of thing when we prepare the skills training for them, because, you know, if we need uh, a training uh, for example, uh, uh, to become an entrepreneur, uh, but we actually uh, provide, uh, you know, uh, provide them some kind of uh, other training and which is no use of, then, uh, then there is uh, uh, really, uh, that is really a problem for the women. So uh, it's really important to consider their need and also the local opportunities so that uh, the women actually uh, can use uh, the skills training uh, as, as they like, uh, um, uh, for them. On the other hand, you know, uh, we have pre-departure uh, training, which is actually for, for those who are uh, uh, at the stage of departure. So Bangladesh government actually organized pre-departure training for both men and women, which, which is uh, mandatory. But in the pre-departure training, what kind of information they really need to make their migration success. So that is really important to consider rather than you know, giving all the information to them when uh, they are waiting for departure. So, so that's the 
that kind of context, situations, and the need of the women really need to be considered if we think about, uh, you know, uh, 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 gender responsive, uh, 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 you know, program for women migrant workers. For the other hand, you know, the women who were left behind, uh, we really need to uh, understand their needs and context. So uh, what kind of problems they are, uh, uh, you know, they are facing. For example, I said many, uh, many female women, the many female spouses of the migrant workers, they, uh, you know, uh, they stay alone and there is no uh, much support for them. So what kind of protection they actually need, we need to consider if we really want to uh, uh, ensure the uh, security and protection for them. We really need to consider uh, the education uh, or information they need. For example, from us, from uh, from OCAP, we organize spouse group orientation. We call it spouse group orientation. This is basically for the female spouses of the migrant workers so that they understand uh, 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 the whole migration context. They have knowledge on rights. They have knowledge of the protection mechanism, which is uh, which are available at the local level. We also provide them orientation on the uses of the remittances and also how to maintain good health, particularly sexual and reproductive health. And you know, one of the uh, yeah, uh, female spouses was saying, you know, when I went to visit them after two years of the project uh, uh, about the impact, she was saying that after the training, she didn't need to go to the doctor with her child uh, or also for her. Uh, so it was really uh, in, uh, impressive that, yes, the, the women really need uh, 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 the interventions that that really makes sense for them. So uh, that, that we really uh, think uh, about on the other hand, it is also important to create agency and empowerment among the uh, among the women, uh, so that you know they have some sort of capacity uh, to resist them. While all kind of uh, you know challenges they 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 uh, they, uh, they encounter for, and they have uh, you know enough uh, you know ability to go to. Uh, to the mechanism to 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 get redressed to file complaints, uh, and that's why it's also need uh, uh, unity among the uh, among the community people, particularly the spouses, uh, female spouses, and uh, uh, and uh, and uh, also uh, it is important to link them uh, with the services the local uh, services provided by the local government because it's really important that there are many services at local level but uh, the women uh, may not aware of these or they have lack of access because of uh, you know uh, many issues for example political influence for example they have no uh, 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 no uh, no ability to uh, to uh, uh, to fight for that like something so uh, so so that's all our real challenges that the women actually face in the context of migration, in the context of climate change, and finding livelihoods, or you know, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, to to live on actually. And uh, these are very small uh, and very uh, 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 less. This this seems to be very small or very less only, but I think this issues really need to consider uh, uh, at all levels uh, from international to local and uh, we should have a very comprehensive policy, uh, uh, coherence policy, uh, integrating all the challenges that the women face on ground. So, so thank, thanks all, uh, that's from my end at this moment. Thank you, Shakuru, um, also for highlighting um, the importance of gender responsive pre departure trainings. And I think what you pointed out about the spouse orientations, I think that's very innovative, um, something um, I think that can be considered to be uh, replicated elsewhere so that everybody knows for those who stay behind, you know, what are some of the, um, you know, the, their rights and responsibilities and how to access services such as health services, as you pointed out. And now um, I'm turning over to Jenna. Thanks so much, Inkri. Um, you know, I'd like to highlight, you know, while on the one hand, we realize that these are longstanding gender inequalities and, and structural realities, we have um, a lot of, I, I think we have a wider um, uh, uh, scope, we have um, uh, climate change and 
uh, environmental degradation affecting more and more communities globally. Uh, and we still have responses to those challenges happening in very localized and kind of ad hoc ways, I find. Um, certainly not integrated, as, as mentioned by my colleague, and certainly not um, uh, going multi-scalar from local uh, to, to global in, in terms of response. You know, we, we see the situation of, you know, women in, in Peru, for example, in rural areas in Peru, facing massive um, uh, challenges in terms of securing food and water uh, because of uh, temperature fluctuations that are so extreme um, that it means that they're now having to, to, to go through um, logging areas and all the way, uh, you know, really far distances to be able to secure food and water. And that does require a localized response. And what I think ends up happening is there ends up this being this tension that the localized responses end up being the um, stopgap measures, the, the kind of immediate one-off uh, things we need to do to address something that's acute or something that's uh, a very localized problem. And I think integrating those together and having a, a broader look at what are all the factors that are leading to this context in the first place and trying to address those root causes um, I think are still being left by the wayside. And to be truly gender responsive, I think we need to be doing that. I mean, we see some exceptional um, initiatives happening, such as the women-led um, uh, fog harvesting for uh, uh, in Morocco, um, which I think is fascinating. And I think a really interesting example of, of um, you know, how a technological solution can be used to actually address uh, a situation in a very localized context where we're, we're facing um, difficulty in accessing potable water. And, um, and I think, you know, in this, in, in, in those contexts, you can come up with, or you've seen some, I think there's exceptional examples out there and, uh, and uh, some really great uh, options um, to think about in terms of trying to, uh, to address particular kinds of problems and situations uh, in a gender responsive way. But I think what's missing is a broader uh, approach that is uh, one to run around governance, where we're thinking about um, a system that enables hearing uh, the voices of women in our decision making about what needs to be done. Um, it involves consultation with organizations that work with women, with, with gender diverse populations, to really try to understand what are the challenges, what are the ways that they would like to solve those challenges. Um, and uh, and if, if migration is one of them, then how can we facilitate that, for example? But maybe it's not. Maybe it's about coming up with a way to have potable water in their community. But I think it's about uh, integrating an approach that absolutely foregrounds the perspective of migrants or of individuals in communities themselves where the issues are taking place. And, and I think um, uh, that must happen early on. I think um, we need more uh, gender um, disaggregated data on the experiences of climate change and of uh, the experiences of those things that we, from a migrant migration perspective, would call drivers, right? Um, uh, and, but we also need uh, more data on ex gendered experiences of migration in the context of climate change. So if moving because of um, flood or disaster um, what are the gendered experiences along the way um, as people try to access protection and security in that process? Um, we know something and we know a lot more about the experiences, the gendered experiences of migration in the context of conflict, for example, than we do about um, uh, that in terms of the con uh, context of climate change. And I think the other thing is that um, the those that are experiencing acute um, uh, and sort of moments of disaster or, or crises, there's a very different set of experiences and I think a, a set of realities and challenges than those are experiencing slow onset. And so I think trying to understand the gendered ways and unpack that in, in that same detailed level is vital. And so there I would just say research and evidence, we need more of that um, to help, um, uh, help us um, uh, find solutions. I think we need to have gender-based evaluation of policies and programs aimed at addressing climate change. Um, you, you know, and, and not all of these have to be those that are actually specifically focused on women or those that are even um, about migration per se, but they could be things like, um, you know, 
thinking about when a when a, a government or a um, or a, a, a a country decides to implement a given policy on carbon, for example, what impact does that have in terms of uh, a gendered impact? Really thinking about um, how gender will actually uh, play a role in all uh, aspects of climate uh, change uh, related policy. And then thinking about the way policies are linked, right? Um, Climate change policy on itself or, or policy directed around environment uh, is still relatively nascent and it's still only one domain. And we know that it's cross cutting, right? That it impacts uh, policy on labor and, and that the policies on, on labor, on migration, on climate, on development do need to be in conversation um, and so not stuck in policy silos. Um, in terms of thinking about gender responsiveness more broadly, how important it is to do those things I've mentioned, but also to do things like gender-based budgeting, um, thinking about how much funding we're spending and where we're spending it, and is it having uh, even or equal, rather, outputs on uh, in terms of impacts on, on women and men? Uh, is it actually furthering, and this is the important part, to not uh, lose track and to have our eye on the ball. The eye on the ball is not to just respond to whatever current crisis is happening. Yes, that's important, especially from a humanitarian perspective and a protection perspective. But really, the eye on the ball is gender equality. <laughs> the eye on the ball is how do we respond in such a way that we're not back here again in two years, five years, ten years? How do we respond in such a way that it's transformative towards actually uh, rethinking things? So we're not just saying, oh, great, we're going to find you a regular pathway so you can go and become a domestic care worker and uh, face precarious employment. Uh, as a woman. That's your pathway. Knock yourself out. That is not about trying to actually uh, rethink our responses so that we don't perpetuate gender inequality going forward in our responses. Thanks. I'll end there. Thank you very much, uh, Jenna. Um, it's uh, important that you underscored the need for uh, more in participatory, inclusive approaches to developing solutions and also for um, the uh, importance of cross-cutting policies across these different sectors. And you know, when there are policies, we need budgets. So we need gender-based budgeting in order to ensure that these are resourced. Thank you very much. So let's move on to our final question. I'd like to um, speakers please uh, uh, respond in a very brief manner, just two minutes, because we are running a little bit behind uh, our schedule. So um, the last question is, thinking about these issues that we discussed. Can you share with us your top three actions for policymakers and practitioners to address these issues from a gender perspective, including any actions targeted towards the LGBTIQ plus migrant community? Shakuru, uh, we're looking forward to learning from you and your experiences in Bangladesh. Uh, and then we'll ask Jenna and finally Georgia to take their turns on this question. Shakuru, over to you. Thank you. Yes, I'll be very brief, actually. Uh, I think uh, we really think from uh, uh, two levels. One is local level and also uh, the national level. Uh, uh, from local level, I will say that it's really important to think about the community-led interventions. Uh, 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 and uh, it should be uh, to create awareness among the people, both men and women, because when we consider the migration, particularly women migration, this is uh, a taboo issue in uh, many parts of the country because of the patriarchy. Uh, and that's why the women actually face stigma and discrimination uh, uh, because of uh, the migration experiences. And uh, there is no unity. There is lack of empowerment among the women. So I really believe that if there is a community-led interventions, including uh, awareness raising activities, uh, you know, enhancing capacity, uh, uh, and leadership among the women, uh, that can 
really create some kind of positive uh, uh, you know impacts at community level uh, to to increase uh, uh, respect to the women uh, uh, as uh, in, in throughout the uh, you know uh, in, in different uh, cycles actually uh, cycle of migration or if they want to stay back home for example if we talk about uh, female spouses of the migrants if they are organized they know how to uh, you know ensure their rights how to access to the government uh, uh, entitlements and facilities and they are united that is very easy for them uh, 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 to go and uh, um, and access on the other hand uh, i think uh, it is also important to have some um, uh, uh, interventions for uh, uh, for livelihoods, uh, which is actually uh, to enhance uh, the economic empowerment of the women, because this is really important in the context of uh, uh, you know in, in in the context of Bangladesh, like countries, because uh, if if the women have economic empowerment, then then they can actually overcome many challenges, many struggles they face. Uh, um, and so that that's important thing, and we really need to consider what kind of livelihoods they really uh, uh, can you know uh, uh, can start from their own community sometimes we actually provide training for example if it is women then we provide tailoring training but you know uh, tailoring training is not uh, uh, something that the women only the women should receive so we really need to consider the local opportunities and context that i have already mentioned to to uh, to design the livelihood options for the women uh, and uh, for their uh, economic empowerment and third one is strengthening local government actually because local government can increase uh, budget uh, uh, for uh, inclusion uh, women friendly social safety net programs at local level and that that would be really great if the local government units take this kind of initiative so it's really important to in, enhance their uh, strength uh, uh, in this regard they can also ensure uh, 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 local redressal system and in, improve the local redressal system uh, so that the, uh, the the women can file complaints and get uh, uh, access to the justice at local level going uh, instead of going to the courts and uh, some some other places it's also important uh, 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 to have uh, a comprehensive uh, protection mechanism in place, particularly in the local government level, so that it really ensures protection uh, and you know safe women and the girls uh, from insecurity in different aspects like sexual abuse and exploitation and so on and so on uh, uh, so uh, it's really important to improve uh, strengthen the local government and also increase the budget for them uh, and apart from that at national level i i must say that uh, what uh, ms jena already mentioned that there are different uh, policies and legislations um, uh, in place at this moment for example we have migration act 2030 we have migration policy, we have disaster dismissment policy and strategy. So there are so many, uh, but it's really need to have a, a cohesion among all these policies. And we have to uh, uh, ensure the gender dimensions, uh, the gender needs are really addressed in a way so that the uh, uh, so that the women have really access to them and uh, it really create a, 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 a change uh, among the women. So, so that's that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Shakuru, for highlighting these local uh, as well as national level um, interventions and actions that are critical. Um, um, I'd like to now go um, to Jenna. And again, um, if you can answer within two minutes, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, Ankur. I'll try my best. So, um, you know, just to echo a little bit what Shakuru said, you know, I think we, we need to be thinking about um, things such as access to justice, um, access to education, skills, edu employment um, uh, in countries of origin, transit, and destination from a migration perspective. I also, and because those things are all important to addressing barriers that would be there for women and LGBTQ plus to mitigate um, uh, and, and uh, climate change impacts and, and to be resilient. I think we, the second thing I need, be, I think is vital to do is to consult women and LGBT 
TIQ migrants or individuals um, prior to migration, during migration, um, to identify problems. What are what are their issues? What are their primary concerns? What are the short-term and long-term ideas that they have uh, for mitigating uh, the situations that, that they're in? And to involve them in design, implementation, and evaluation of policy responses along the way uh, uh, throughout all uh, stages of the policy cycle. Finally, I'd say, um, we need to be aligning responses with existing frameworks. I mean, uh, most countries are uh, signatories to SETA, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. It is vital that our responses do not deviate away from that. It is vital that uh, responses to climate change don't lead to uh, actually uh, human rights abuses or, or, or challenging or things that actually put those uh, kinds of of international frameworks in, into question or are contrary to them. Uh, we have to ensure that our responses are actually um, calibrated around our long-term sustainable development goals, you know, goal five and, and really thinking about gender equality should be uh, the uh, the um, um, the way in which we try to calibrate all our responses. So always asking that question: How will this response have an impact, or how will this policy impact gender equality? Does it actually further it, or does it further entrench it? And I think always asking those questions along the way uh, is uh, vital. Thanks. Thank you, Jenna, for this uh, record uh, in answering the question. Um, uh, and now, Georgia, two minutes to, for you to answer this final question. And then I'd like to open the floor for uh, one very brief um, round of uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you. I will be brief, um, especially as my colleagues already covered most of the points that I wanted to raise. But yeah, I mean, uh, just to reiterate the importance to um, uh, strengthening knowledge on the gender aspects of the climate migration food security nexus, that's key to inform policy making and ensure that policies and programs do effectively respond to differentiated needs and capacities. And also that they do not unintentionally exacerbate uh, inequality by disregarding these issues. And uh, in doing so, um, I wanted to stress that it's very important to analyze gender through the lens of intersectionality again, so not to limit the gender analysis to binary interpretations of men versus women, but really to look at the full spectrum of vulnerabilities um, related also to uh, age, ethnicity, race, uh, etc. So there is a need to promote systematic data disaggregation, and that should be done, uh, should be applied to all disciplines, because only by doing that we can gain a, a good understanding and really unpack these complex relationships. Um, I want also to strengthen, I mean, to, 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 to reiterate the point about the importance of strengthening multisectoral and also multi-scale co coordination and coherence. Um, to promote the gender, gender responsive and integrated approaches. Um, as, as we have seen, these processes are, are so interrelated that sil silos approaches simply do not work. And, and, and gender cuts across all dimensions of migration, food security and, and climate change. So it is very important to foster dialogue and to promote cross-learning also across these sectors as they all have specific insights into gender which can help develop holistic approaches. It's important to strengthen the capacity, obviously, of national and local actors to close the gender gap. And, and thanks for highlighting the, 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 the again, the importance of, of, um, of, of paying attention to, to local actors. Um, and climate services and national extension services, for example, need to be sensitized even more on gender differentiated needs and approaches to make climate smart technologies uh, more accessible to women, rural advisory services will need to become more responsive to gender issues. Um, and this, at, this has to be done at, from global to regional and, and local level. We should uh, assess the trade-offs of climate change adaptation and mitigation policies and programs. Climate change adaptation is not inherently positive. We, we already know that there is evidence of that and does not benefit everyone equally. Um, there is the risk to increase inequality and marginalization to, through climate change adaptation and mitigation policies that disregard these dif differential needs. And um, yes, again, as, as Jenna stressed out, the importance of having gender responsive climate and agricultural budgeting 
And, and, and finally, I conclude by saying that we should not forget to raise and promote women's participation in decision-making at all levels, have their voices heard, and capitalize on women's capacities, as women already make a tremendous contribution to strengthening the resilience of their families and communities. Um, and we need to raise, and we have, we have been saying this for a while, we need to raise women's voices in global climate negotiations such as the Conference of Parties, uh, and um, which is about to, to start in a few weeks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Georgia. Um, also, um, just, you know, um, underscoring, you know, the importance of an intersectional approach to finding solutions to these press pressing issues, the importance of intersectoral policies, um, and the uh, importance of raising the capacity of um, uh, various uh, stakeholders, and also in empowering women and girls to participate meaningfully in all responses. Um, so we are almost running out of time, uh, but if there is a, a, a question in the room, um, please uh, let me know. And uh, I'd like to then hand over the floor to um, anybody who would like to answer or ask a question. I see Australia um, has a question. Please, Australia, take the floor. Um, and then I would ask um, the panelists to respond within 30 seconds. So this is a um, super, super quick um, answering Q&A session um, for this side event. Uh, Australia, you've got the floor. Thank you very much. And thank you to the panel for a really interesting discussion. I think it's very timely and, and wonderful that we can discuss these issues in this forum. Um, Georgia, I, something that you said that I found really interesting was um, the potential overfocus on specific adaptation measures. So things like technical measures, and perhaps we need to focus on things um, a little, little broader, like underlying soci socioeconomic factors um, um, when we're thinking about the notion of climate adaptation. Uh, I was wondering if you might have seen any examples of this um, or have any ideas of how we could how we could do this of course no problem if not maybe it's just the maybe that's the mass message that we take home that uh, we all have a lot more thinking um, to do on this um, but thank you for that very important point I thought that was very interesting thank you Georgie would you like to um, respond yes um, I'll try to be brief and thanks for the question um, Yes, the, the, the issue is that, um, especially at, at, at the beginning, and because of the need to differentiate programs and policies only focus on climate change adaptation from those focus on development, there was this tendency to over-focus on, 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 on technical solutions, most of the times top-down solutions that are uh, disregarding, in fact, all the structural issues um, uh, that they generate inequality and vulnerability in the first place that we discussed today, right? So, uh, for example, um, uh, the, the development of, 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 of climate smart technologies um, per se doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't lead into uh, an increased uptake of climate smart, uh, of, of climate smart ad adaptive technologies, um, at least not equally uh, between when we, men and women, because there might be issues related, for example, social norms that impede women to, to, to access such technologies or, or um, inequality in terms of access to credit or even uh, inequality in terms of education and access to information. So this is just to give a very brief example of, 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 of how a, a mismatch between a specific and generic uh, adaptation and adaptive capacity, it's a it risk to really reinforce inequality rather than help um, addressing the structural causes of, of vulnerability. So what I was trying to say before is that we, really, we, we need to bring back the development dimension into climate change adaptation and mitigation. Thank you, Georgia, for this additional clarification and information. I think that was probably very helpful, and Australia is nodding, so thank you so much. Uh, and now, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to uh, Cinziana from IOM to provide closing remarks. Cinziana, they have the floor. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, and thank you for the excellent discussion. I think we all learned um, a lot today, and we have had um, fantastic panelists and fantastic organizers, and I, I just want to start by thanking um, UN Women and the permanent mission of Germany and uh, the Women, Women in Migration Network um, who, together with IOM, put together uh, this, this fantastic discussion. When we look at the links between climate change, human mobility, and women, I think there, there's something very striking um, to say, and I think our panelists brought the right examples um, on, on all these issues. I'll try to, to summarize some of the key, key messages that we heard today. And I think perhaps the, the most um, shocking one is the unequal participation in decision-making processes. Um, of women, and this is something that we, we have to work a lot more today. Um, we have to make sure that women fully contribute to the climate-related planning, to disaster preparedness, to disaster prevention, but also policy-making and implementation. And this doesn't mean just consulting women, it just means including women on decision-making processes. We've also heard that women tend to hold less negotiating power um, and control over natural resources than men. This um, impacts back into the lack of access to decision making and, and consistently puts them into more vulnerable situations in the face of disasters. We've also heard that women and girls are more likely to die in, in the extreme weather events that lead to disasters compared to men and boys. And when they survive, women tend to struggle more through recovery efforts. This is very concerning when we think that of, um, often women are forced to work harder to secure the resources, and we've heard the issues related to land, the issues related to water, that they have to walk further for these resources. Um, it's the same for, for fuel, and in, in the, the current context, we have to, to think about the energy uh, contributions as well. We've also heard that disaster scenarios can create very strong conditions for gender-based violence, and this is particularly of concerns for, for women. And this is also linked to the, the trafficking discussion and the, the trafficking points made by our colleague from Bangladesh as well, um, and the protection questions that we have in the, in the situations of disasters for women and girls. We've also heard that disasters tend to result um, in increased rural to urban migration among men in some countries. And this means some women are left behind with additional household burdens. Um, they need to obtain remunerated work, they need to be in charge of the land, they need to be in charge of the household, they need to be in charge of raising the children. All this uh, put on, on the shoulders of women in the situations of disasters. We've also heard that women and girls can be more dependent on natural resources and climate sensitive work to sustain livelihoods. And if we lose these um, climate sensitive livelihoods, women and girls' um, ability to, to safely secure resources for their families and their households can diminish. Finally, we, we've heard that women's capacity to adapt to the adverse effects of climate change and environmental degradation can also be more limited. We know that women wait longer to migrate because of the higher social costs and risks and burdens uh, put on them. These include social um, uh, structures, but also cultural practices, lack of education, and the reproductive roles um, in society for women. While these, um, these considerations are, are very bleak and um, make us ask a lot of hard questions, we've also heard great solutions that our partners, that, our, that member states, that civil society, that the UN are, are putting in place. And I think we've heard uh, nine, six priorities, three priorities from each, but I think I counted in total like 15. So I think we don't lack solutions. I think we really lack um, our, our capacity to, to implement and to, to move into action. And I'll try to summarize some of the, the ideas that we were put forward. 
We need to place women's leadership at the center of our collective action. We need to make sure that women and girls are recognized as rights holders and active forces of change regarding climate action. And we need to make sure that disaster risk reduction agenda accounts for the enormous impact of disasters on women. We have heard a very strong call for disaggregated data by age, sex, and gender. We need to make sure that we have this incorporated into comprehensive analysis and comprehensive risk management. We've also heard the need for secure financial resources to make, and to make sure that these are put into the hands of women and women-led organizations. And finally, we've heard the need for coordination, multilateral coordination, bilateral coordination, and just in general, more collaboration among all, stake for, all stakeholders. With this, I want to finish. I'm not sure I did extreme justice to our panel, but thank you so much again. Thank you so much, uh, Cynthiana, for, these excellent, for this excellent summary uh, and closing remarks. Um, everybody, uh, thank you very much, everybody, um, for participating to, in today's um, side event. Uh, thank you so much for the excellent speakers, for their rich discussions, and also for the um, solution-orientated um, um, approaches that they shared with us today. Thank you. Thank you.